everyone. Um, this is uh, CalTP Review and Refresh, uh, uh, hosted by um, uh, AICCU Ed. Uh, my name is Daryl Blanks, and I am from uh, Fresno Pacific University. Slip over to the next slide, and I'll let Shauna introduce herself. I'm Shauna Matamala. I'm from University of Laverne, and we're so happy to see all of you here. Welcome. Um, go ahead. So today what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at um, uh, cycle two. We're going to do an overview of cycle two, answer some specific questions along the way. Uh, hopefully, as uh, and as those questions come up, just post those in the chat or we'll have some time to pause where you can uh, ask questions, uh, reference some of the resources that are available to support people that are doing cycle two. Uh, some of the, the most primary resource that you want to be involved, uh, have copy of is the performance assessment guide. This is really the, uh, the Bible, so to speak, of the uh, TPA. A lot of times when I contact the state and ask them questions, they'll say, oh, on page, da, 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 it says this. And so uh, you can uh, bypass having to ask a question by, um, by having those. And so that's one of the things that... Um, uh, that you know, we suggest that you have reference to. It'll save you a, a lot of questions. Go ahead. So, um, just as a reminder, that uh, the Cal TPA is scored in the Pearson system. Uh, when you go to the uh, the uh, CTC exams website and go to the assessments tab, uh, once you register for the TPA. Uh, you will have one year to submit your TPA, and you'll have uh, access to all the templates and all of the um, assessment guides that we've referenced. So let's take a second and talk about the big picture uh, with regards to how the TPA, how, Cal, how cycle two is laid out. Go ahead. So both cycles follow the same uh, uh, kind of four steps. Both require that you get to know and plan your students, then that you teach your lessons and record them. And our suggestion is you record everything. Don't just record three clips or two clips, just record it all. You can always not use stuff, but you can't magically make stuff appear if you don't have it recorded. Then you reflect on how the lesson went and in cycle, uh, in cycle two, you plan and teach a follow-up lesson based on the assessment data that you've gathered during your lessons. Go ahead and go to the next part. And so let's take a look at what you're gonna submit. So for step one, you're gonna submit uh, uh, the following six pieces of evidence. You're gonna talk about the context of your class. This is where you describe your class, uh, focusing on assets and learning needs of those students talking about uh, the background of your EL learners and talking about prior knowledge that students might have. Then you're going to uh, submit the learning segment um, template. Template B has a beginning part that gives the overall standards, ELDN content standards, uh, plus the overall topic of your week of instruction, three to five days of instruction. Plus it has uh, subsequent tables for each of the days that you're going to teach. Then you're going to turn in a, a description of three of your assessments. One assessment will be an example of your informal assessment. One example will be uh, the student self-assessment that students have to uh, engage in. And the final will be a formal assessment that um, will uh, be analyzed and of which you'll submit student work for. We'll talk about that later. You'll give uh, copies of the informal assessment or a blank, a blank copy or a description of that if the informal assessment is um, just a, uh, not a piece of paper, but is a uh, something like a task that you give them, you can describe that task uh, on a Word document. Then for both template, uh, both for assessment E and F, uh, which is the student self-assessment and the formal assessment, you need to have a rubric for those. This is a big piece. So a rubric cannot be a checklist. A rubric cannot be thumbs up, thumbs down, hey, I'm feeling great, I felt like I learned that. It has to be a progression of description of ability on that particular stand. So let's take topic sentence. Let's say that you're going to focus on writing. You're going to do topic sentences, supporting details, and closing sentence. For the topic sentence, you would need to have a progression of descriptors that 
tell you how well they're meeting that standard. So you'd have something below, you'd have something on and something above. It might sound something like this. Maybe the, uh, maybe the, um, the uh, below one would be uh, students uh, write a sentence that uh, starts the paragraph, but is not the topic sentence. Maybe the on one is students write a, a sentence that has the topic in it. Maybe the exceeds would be students uh, write a topic sentence with details that is clear. So that kind of progression has to be in both of your uh, both of your rubrics. It cannot be again. It can't be a checklist. It can't be uh, some kind of a, um, a smile, set of smiling faces or score yourself one to four. It has to be a series of descriptors. Uh, that'll be what you turn in for step number one. Step number two, then. Step number two will include four video clips, and you're going to annotate these like you did in cycle one. So the first one's going to show instruction and assessment of academic language development. You'll need to have that planned in your series of lessons. Uh, student use of educational technology. We'll talk a little bit about that coming up. Uh, instruction and informal assessment. During your series of lessons, you'll give an example of where you are in, uh, students are being engaging in instruction and that you're using informal assessment to uh, help students to, um, under, to, for you to check how they're doing and to give them feedback on how they're doing. And then instruction by you and the students using the student self-assessment for their content. With these four video clips, you are going to annotate them for uh, four different titles. Go ahead. In step three, you're going to uh, provide uh, you're going to provide three copies of student work. You're going to provide uh, a, an exceeded, a meet, and a not yet met for the formal assessment. This copy, uh, these copies should have a completed rubric with them, and the rubric should have feedback on it. Or you should have a mechanism by which you've given feedback and have that described. So, like for very young children, maybe you do that orally, and you would write out what you told the student. Um, and then you have to do uh, an analysis of the formal assessment uh, that reflects on how the class and the three students did um, in your uh, series of lessons. For step four, then you're going to describe what went well and what didn't go well, and then you're going to plan for a follow-up lesson. This follow-up lesson can either be a reteaching lesson where you reteach something that you saw in your formal or uh, in your assessments that didn't go well, um, and uh, or it could be an extension activity if your class is ready to move on to something else. It can be a whole class or a group, uh, a group of a small group of students. You have to include a annotated video clip with this lesson. So this would be your fifth uh, video clip that you submit. And in this one, you're going to do an annotation for why this uh, video clip meets the requirements for uh, being a follow-up lesson or extended lesson. Go ahead. So those are the things that you're going to. Those are the things that you're going to focus on uh, when you submit. Now, one of the things to think a little bit about is um, when you get ready to prepare your materials for uh, submission, you'll want to pull from the assessment guide the the rubrics. The rubrics are what the evaluators use to score your your work, and this is kind of important. Notes: it, this is in fact the answer key. This is where the answers are to how do I know if I've if I if if I'm going to pass, and so um, the we're going to go over how the rubrics use the how the assessors use the rubrics. Uh, but for cycle two, there's nine rubrics. You need a score of 21 or more to pass, and you cannot get more than one one. So one of the things to really focus on is looking at the evidence for level three, four, and five, and asking yourself once you've completed your templates, do I have evidence uh, to um, show that uh, level three, four, or five is met in each of these nine areas? You really want to look at um, levels one and two to know what to avoid. So in several cases, there's places where if you leave something out, then you'd end up with uh, a level one. You really want to try to avoid level ones, makes it difficult to get the total score. And again, you only get two of those, and then you don't pass, no matter how much your total score is. So go on, let's take a look at the rubric for a second. So these are the essential questions that are, are, are um, assessed by the, by the rubrics. 
the essential questions uh, guide what the rubric is looking for in general. Go ahead and go on to the rubric. Okay, so here's how the evaluators score your paper. They start at level three, okay? And they go through and they look for evidence for each of the little paragraphs. So for example, the first thing they're gonna look for in 2.1 is they're gonna look for a learning segment that includes manageable content-specific learning goals, ELD goals that are clearly built on students' prior content knowledge. They're gonna to look to see if that is in your lesson segments. Did you describe how you connected that clearly to the, the student's prior knowledge? If that's there, then they'll look for the next thing, then the next thing, then the next thing. If it's not there, and this is an important thing to understand, if any of the, if any of the pieces are not there, they automatically go down to level two. So the thing to understand is this is not holistic scoring. It's not, hey, there's six things. I think I got five of them that should give me a three. It is, if I want a three, all of them have to um, have, all of them have to uh, be met in level three. Now I wanna point out a couple of quick things that are really important. First, notice that level three talks about having ELD goals. So it calls for ELD goals for your students. If you have EL students, you have to have ELD standards and ELD goals. If you leave those off, you will get a nasty little error code and you won't get it scored and you'll have to pay again. So you kind of want to avoid that because that's like a, 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 a bit of a nuisance <laughs> to be honest. But um, uh, so if you have EL students, you have to have an ELD goal along with the ELD standards. Uh, the second bullet point, if you notice, says that you have universal design for learning, that your strategies are clearly described within the three to five lessons. So when it talks about the student, when it talks about the, um, the, the student um, activities, you wanna identify or have clearly identified where you're thinking of universal design for learning aspects. And let me take a second answer just kind of a, 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 couple, of, uh, a couple of questions. Uh, so with regards to universal design for learning, um, you do not, uh, have to explicitly say that you are uh, using universal design for learning, but I would. So when I'm describing my student activities, I would reference from the universal design for learning chart. This is connected to representation 3.1, blah, blah, blah. I would make it explicit for the person reading it. One, it helps you to know that you've planned those things. And two, it helps the evaluator to know that you know that you are purposefully putting those characteristics in your lesson. Um, the second, so, so in that, and in order to get a three, you have to have those, um, those strategies have to be in there. Someone also asked, could we, have, um, could we have different ELD goals for different lessons? Yeah, as long as they all relate to the overarching ELD standard, that you have for the whole unit or the whole set of lessons. So this is kind of an important thing to kind of think about is, um, uh, yeah, someone, someone said, I didn't use the word ELD guidelines, I'm actually God too. That's probably because the strategies were minimally described. So thanks uh, Eve for pointing that out and giving, us, giving other people a little point. I always have students expl be explicit. Be clear. You're providing evidence to the evaluators that what you um, that the that what you're providing is that you know you're providing those things. So being clear and connecting clearly to the the rubrics is a is a great piece of advice. So when you look at the level three, you want to go down and double check and make sure that you have all the things that are there. One of the things that sometimes is left out, if you look at the last one in particular, is that uh, grouping strategies have to be purposeful and they have to be appropriate for what you're teaching. So when you have whole group activities, talk about why whole group is appropriate for that. When you have pairs, talk about why you're gonna use pairs. Um, and, you know, and when you're gonna move between those in a group, talk about why you're gonna move between those. Uh, again, connecting clearly to those. Now, different teachers, uh, uh, Lynn asked a good question about uh, different ways to write the standards. What's the proper way to write the standards? So if you go to the ELD standards for the state, 
um, you will notice, and when I'll do this, when Shauna picks up her part, I'll go pick up the ELD standards and I'll answer Lynn's question and I'll show you what you make sure is referenced. And then uh, that'll help you out with that, Lynn, okay? Um, so if everything, is, if everything is met in level three, then they'll go over to level four and see if those things are in there also. If everything's there for level four, then they'll go over to level five. I would really look to be solid on level three Look over at level four and see how many of those you can grab also. Uh, threes and fours, again, uh, you know, give you a good clear chance of passing by a mile. You don't want to shoot for that 21 because inevitably you'll think you have a three and rats, you missed it by one point. Uh, that can be frustrating also. So let me stop for just a question. Questions about the rubrics and how the rubrics are used to score the TPA. Okay, and click on to the next one. So, whoops, hold on. Okay, so the one the one thing that helps you with this. Um, uh, oh, how many rubrics do you have to do? You have you'll have one rubric for the student self assessment, and you'll have one rubric for the formal assessment. I would suggest that those line up pretty well. As a matter of fact, as you're planning your week of instruction, it's not a bad idea to have students do their self-assessment on a practice piece of work that's related to the formal assessment. Um, okay. And, and, and so in a, in a sense, they have an opportunity to kind of check their own progress, get feedback from you on how they're doing, and then you can adjust your instruction to then match the, um, uh, to then, you know, get them prepared for doing the formal assessment. The uh, rubrics that I'm showing you now are almost identical for the world languages cycle TPA. Yeah, the, the, the elementary ones, the single subject one world languages are almost, they're almost all identical. Johnny, you wanna answer the question about, we don't do ELD standards for world language single subject students. And that is correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. And thank you so much, Daryl. And I was, I was trying to share the slides in the chat and I wasn't able to, if you're able to figure that out when I'm talking, that would be great. A number of people were asking for those. Okay. All right, thank you. So we'll keep going and I'll try and monitor the chat and answer questions as we go along. All right, so I'm going to now be going through each of the steps and providing you more details of what you should be including and what uh, the cycle is asking for. So the first thing that you're going to be doing is um, similar to cycle one, you're going to be writing about the students. So remember in cycle one, you learned about the students through both informal and formal methods. You wrote about their funds of knowledge. Do you use an asset based lens to write about your students? So you will also be writing about contextual information about your group of of students for this cycle. Uh, if you are using the same group of students that you used for uh, cycle one, you are allowed to copy and paste from what the information you used in cycle one into cycle two, but you need to use the cycle two template. Um, you'll also be planning three assessment types, as Daryl mentioned, uh, informal, formal, and student self-assessment. And you'll be explaining and giving rationale uh, for why you made each of these assessment choices. And you'll be um, gathering all the materials and rubrics. And we'll talk more about the rubrics. I know people had questions about that. All right. So let's talk about the assessments in more detail. The first one you'll be planning is an informal assessment. And this informal assessment is a checking for understanding. And it's the only assessment that you do not need to provide a rubric for. And um, something to think about is you do need to include uh, higher order thinking and academic language in your informal assessment. So some examples might be um, in, use, having students use individual whiteboards where they're holding up after you've taught them informal uh, 
academic language words, or you could use gestures. Like I've seen teachers teach the angles. So of course we all know the obtuse and acute, and you could have students um, making the gestures to check for understanding regarding that academic language. Um, so you do need to intentionally use the higher order thinking words, um, analyze, uh, interpret, in, and all of those words as you're talking about your informal assessment. All right, and then the next thing you'll want to think about is the formal assessment. And you will need to include a rubric that you're going to score the students on. So something to think about is you do not want to do all true faults and multiple choice because those don't work well for creating a rubric. And the second piece is you're going to have to write pages and pages analyzing the results of your formal assessment. So if you use multiple choice or true faults, you're not going to be able to write the in-depth analysis that you're thinking of. So some good things to think about are um, short answer, essay, uh, student presentations, interviews, um, portfolios. So you really want to think about something that you can create a rubric for, for your formal assessment. And then you are also going to be creating a student self-assessment. And for this student self-assessment, you need to have a rubric that the student completes. And Daryl was talking earlier that it needs to be more than a checklist. You know, a lot of times English teachers will, you know, will write an essay and we'll have like a checklist to look for. In this case, it actually needs to be a rubric connected to the learning goals. So for instance, if it's a second grade lesson on telling times, I would create a rubric related to my learning goals. So student, I am able to tell time to the half hour. And then as a student, I would rate myself one through four. Four meaning I completely get it, I could teach others. Three, I, I'm fairly confident. Two, I'm okay, but I'm struggling a little bit. One, I need some help. And so I would score myself. And then I'm able to tell time to five minutes. And again, I would score myself. I'm able to tell, elapsed time and I would score myself. I can tell time using word problems and I would score myself. So the idea is you're having students score themselves so that they have a better understanding of where they are in the unit and what they need help on. And then that also gives you ideas for um, what you maybe need to do some reteaching and teaching on for them based on that self-assessment results. Okay, so um, there's some ideas for you for self-assessments, and I'm going to click here to show you an example. It will take me there. All right. Can everyone see that? Yes. Um, so here's an example. You would want to do more than just one. Sean, um, but here's an example. Shana, I'm sorry. Check your uh, share. Okay, let me do a new share. Yeah, you got, you got now, can you see it? Yeah, great. So here's an example. You would wanna do more than one learning goal, but here's an example of one learning goal, goal and how uh, students would use this to do a self-assessment. Can you make it bigger? Um, I'm not able to. Okay, Sorry. thank you. Mm -hmm. um, wait, let me try down at the bottom. Yes, I can. Here we go. That's better. Here we go. So you can see this is a kindergarten example because a lot of people ask me, how could you do a self-assessment in kindergarten? But the idea is you would have something fairly simple, but you would talk the th students through and read them what the descriptors are. So you would tell them, okay, we've been working on uh, making up rhymes. And here's what you would score it as. If you're doing fine, that means that you can rhyme four words or more with no help from the teacher. Let's circle that if you think you can do that. So you would talk them through each of the scores and then have them circle it. Okay, all right, let me go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, and then the next thing you're going to do is uh, the teach and assess, which is step two. You're going to um, review the five rubrics for teach and assess and make sure that you included everything in the levels three. And just like Daryl was talking about, you're going to try for levels four and five. And of course, avoid everything in levels one and two. The rubrics, as Daryl was saying, are really your 
cheat your cheat sheet to getting the perfect score. They really outline everything you're looking for. So I'm an assessor for cycle two and how we're trained is we're actually given a little box and we have to put a box around everything that we can find as evidence in your task to prove that you deserve a, a three, a four or a five. And that's how we score you. Um, you're, our suggestion is that you record on multiple days throughout your learning segment. Remember, it's a three to five day learning segment and you're gonna record all through. Then you go back and choose the four, four video clips. And I always tell my students to kind of script out what you're planning to do for your video clips. That way you make sure that you include everything in there that you're planning to so that you don't miss anything. Uh, and then you're gonna write at least two to three strong annotations for each video clip. Again, you want to look at the rubrics because as an assessor, for those rubrics, like when I score you on the self-assessment, I get to look at the evidence of the video and also the annotations. So maybe you were doing adaptations or modifications um, for focus students, which I'm not going to necessarily know by watching the video, but when I read your annotations, I can see that. And that's going to give you a score of a four or a five. You do want to make sure that you and the students uh, are all visible throughout every single one of the video clips. If you or the students aren't visible, then you can get an automatic score of a one. There's only one video that you're allowed for you not to show, and that's the educational technology video. And we'll talk more about that in a second. I know there's some questions coming through and we will, I'll stop in a second and answer those. So I'm going to talk through the video clips. Because um, I know that's where a lot of stress uh, that people have um, related to the TPA um, is. So for video clip one, uh, this is where you are going to film uh, instruction and assessment using academic language development. And it's no more than five minutes. And I, this is where you want to do something engaging. So like my idea of doing acute and obtuse would be a good example, pair share, individual whiteboards something where you're teaching academic language and also you're engaging students in an activity and you can get feedback on how they're doing. Video clip two is where students need to use educational technology. And in the video, you actually need to show students touching and using technology. So if you're just having them watch a video, that's gonna be a score of a one. It does need to be where they're engaging and interacting with technology to meet the learning goals beyond something that's kind of like drill and practice. So an example, if you have them do something like Quizlet, uh, you will get a, most likely a score of a two. They want you to do something beyond where they are maybe doing some, a Padlet activity or a Flipgrid or something, a jam board, or interacting with Google Slides, or they're manipulating, like if they're learning coins, they're dragging coins onto the screen and off. So that is going to get you a level three. To get you a level four, you want to even go beyond that to include uh, collaboration and choice. So that would be like having, you can either do it on a Padlet or a jam board, and you get to work together in a group to do that. All right, and Nearpod, yes, could would be appropriate. Boom cards would work. I see some of them coming through. All right, the third video clip is inst uh, instruction and informal assessment of content. And this video clip is where you need to show uh, higher order thinking. So in some way, you need to show the students are using higher order thinking and using one of those higher order thinking words. And you're also using some type of informal ass assessment to guide your instruction and possibly change what you're doing. So thank you, Daryl, I saw you shared it. Um, so I gave an example today with a student I was talking through that's to today that's using a math, um, math lesson. They're going to do an error analysis on the board and students are then going to talk in partners and write on their individual whiteboards what was incorrect in the problem and how they would um, solve it. Um, so they identify um, using analysis to find the what was wrong in the problem, talk about it, and then show on their whiteboards. And then the teacher is going to make adjustments to their instruction based on what the students hold up on their whiteboards. All right, and then uh, video clip four is um, where you're going to film 
um, the self-assessment content. And as an assessor, the big thing we're looking for for video four is that you go over the rubric and you teach students how to use that self-assessment rubric. So in many of the videos, I see candidates um, displaying it on um, up on the screen or holding up the rubric. As students are also looking at the rubric, you want to talk through how to complete a self-assessment rubric, what they should be circling. And then if they're older, you want to have them write. So if they gave themselves a three, have them write, why did they score themselves a three? If they're younger, you want to be walking around and asking them, uh, why did you score yourself a three? And maybe scripting out their answers. But for everyone, after you go over the rubric, you do want to walk around for part of the video. And it should show you interacting and giving feedback um, with a couple of students. All right. And I'm going to go back through and let's see a couple of your. Um, I see Kahoot, see some questions. Kahoot would not, would get you a score of a two because um, that's considered like a like a Quizlet type of thing, but Pear Deck would be more interactive. And you, in the video clip, um, you need to show students actually on their computer. It may or may not show their screen, but we you just have to physically be able to show them either on their iPad or physically touching um, their Chromebook or their laptop. And this one can be a small group lesson. So if you don't have one-to-one -one devices, you could do a small group um, with two to three students. This is one of the few video clips you could have just two students. Okay. And for the informal assessment, um, someone asked if it can be on quizzes. It, it could be, but the thing is you need to show that in the moment that you can make adjustments to your teaching. So it would have to be something maybe that's displayed and you're seeing the results and being able to react in the moment to that informal assessment and maybe do some reteaching. So you'll just have to think about logistically if that would work for you. And a Google Doc could definitely work depending on what you're having them do. Nearpod would work. Um, there's not a second rubric for the teacher to fill out for the self-assessment. You'll be filling out the rubric for the formal assessment. Okay, and Ashley, I saw you asked about your little, I think someone asked about their confused um, between the self-assessment and the rubric. So a good example, this if it's a math um, unit. So for instance, I would give the self-assessment would be like four or five problems that kind of go over everything they've learned so far in math. That would be the actual self-assessment. But then I would start the actual video um, after they've completed that self-assessment. And now I'm going to go over the rubric. And that's where students are circling um, how do they think they're doing so far on the unit based on that little um, like kind of pretest they just completed, um, which is actually the self-assessment. All right, and I know there's more questions. Uh, I think I will stop and answer some more of those in a little bit. Some great questions you're asking. Okay, so just a little um, reminder that video clip titles are not the same as annotation titles. So you, what I just talked through are the four video clip titles. Okay, um, we just went over those in detail. The that's the technology, the uh, self-assessment um, video. After you've completed those video clips, you're going to upload them onto the Pearson website. And automatically, you'll be able to see the annotation titles. They will pop up for you as a little drop down menu under your video. So then you're going to click on maybe at like minute um, one. Uh, that's when students are using educational technology. So I'll click on minute one and I'll be able to that code that annotation title and it will mark it for me. And that's when students are using educational technology. And you want to write a description of what they're doing and a rationale for why you're having them do it. And that's what you'll do in your annotation title. So you'll use all of these annotation titles um, at least one time, but we recommend that you use them more than once. Um, and you want to use two or three per video clip. Okay. So then now you've given, uh, you've done all of your videos 
and you've uh, given your formal assessment and you're going to choose, like Daryl was saying, three samples of a high, medium, low um, students that you're going to upload as well with their actual written formal assessments. Then you're gonna reflect on the whole class, how they did on their formal assessment and those three examples. And you're gonna write quite a few pages analyzing how they did on those assessments on, on each learning goal. You're going to connect um, the assessment results also to what you wrote about in steps one and two, when you were learning about students and planning your unit of three to five lessons. You wanna be really specific and actually cite, you can even copy and paste and cite yourself from the first steps. You'll get a much higher score if you're referencing those first two steps. Okay, and you're going to write through the lens of reflection. So really thinking about everything that you learned through this assessment cycle and how you're going to apply that to your, this particular class of students, but also what you learned about um, this assessment cycle in general and how it's going to affect you as a teacher. Okay, and then the last step is you're going to apply based on what you um, learned about all of this and the, your analysis specifically of the formal assessment along with the other assessments, you're going to have to decide if you're going to do a reteach or an extension lesson. And as an assessor, we're told there's two main things that we're looking for in this last video clip and also what you write about here. One is that you base your decision on those assessment results, both the formal, the self, and the informal. So that means if you have five students that did not meet the learning goals, you should not move on the whole class to an extension activity because that is not basing your planning off the assessment results. If you have five students that did not meet the learning goals, you need to do a reteach lesson with those five students. The other thing that we score you on um, is that you do it in a different way if you do a reteach lesson. So for instance, if I teach that whole, uh, if I teach a whole, I'll do a PE example. If I teach a whole unit on, um, on fitness and nutrition, and when I give the um, final assessment, I had them uh, analyze uh, a, a number of things. And I saw that a lot of people were confused about serving size related to calories. Um, and I'm gonna do a small group lesson to make sure people are understanding that. I need to teach it in a different way because the first way I taught it didn't make sense, right? So to teach it in the same way, it's not gonna help anyone. I need to think of a different way to teach it, um, maybe using visuals or actually getting out labels of different food packages and bringing that into class and having them analyze those so that they can have a real life object instead of just um, talking about it theoretically. Okay, so number one, base it off the formal assessments and the other assessment results. Number two, if it's a reteach, I think about it in a different way. So the, the only way you would do an extension is if the whole class met the learning goals in your formal assessment. Then you can plan an extension activity that builds on um, your previous lesson. And you're going to film this. It's a three to five minute lesson. And you'll be doing one annotation uh, for this. Okay, so when you're done writing, just some final tips and then I know we have lots of questions and we'll take plenty of time for those. So you wanna check your work um, by using the rubrics. You can have a peer. You can, I tell my students exchange with one of your classmates and score each other on the rubrics. Um, that's a great thing for this TPA. We are allowed to do that and take advantage of having a peer scoring you. Um, remember you're looking for score levels three, four, or five. Those are all passing. Make sure no ones or twos. If you cannot find the evidence required for a three, go back and revise. Do this for all nine rubrics. Once you're done reviewing, then you're ready to submit to Pearson. So we're gonna to go to the next one. And um, I'm actually, uh, as we talk about this, this is kind of a good roadmap while we answer questions. And Daryl, if you don't mind unmuting, I know I missed a lot in the chat. Maybe we can both uh, tackle some of these questions <laughs> and also let people unmute and ask questions. Okay. <laughs> Did you see any run 
of the chat. I know uh, I missed quite a let's, bit. Let's start where we're at with Erica and we'll work our way back and answer a few. Sure, of these perfect. Questions. Is it okay to do a reteach for the second uh, the second lesson? You mean the follow-up to the series of lessons? Uh, yes, a reteach would be appropriate. Like Shana said, the, the big thing is that whatever you teach in that follow-up lesson after your three to five lessons, it has to be related to what you saw as the evidence in your formal and your assessments. So if in your assessments, you said students didn't learn about topic sentence, you gotta make sure that that's what you're teaching. There's gotta be a clear connection between those two. That's actually what they're looking for. Um, uh, you teach world language and you're uh, uh, develop me, let's see, I'm doing world language, academic language uh, development um, by me uh, storytelling, asking students what words mean in English as I'm storytelling. Um, so, you know, if, if you're working with students and they're, the goal for that activity is to learn new vocabulary, then something along that lines could be, could be important. Remember that you're supposed to be working with instruction and assessment of some kind. So think about how you're gathering that assessment data. Uh, generally, assessments that collect information from one student at a time aren't, um, aren't super indicative of what the whole class is doing. So think about how you're gathering that. Um, if you don't have any high students, this is a great question. So you have three students, you have a, a, a we'll just call them low, medium, high, right? If you don't have, if you don't have, say, the low one, or you don't have a high one, then you can pick two students of different, uh, build, of different um, kind of qualities within the MET range, and that will work. So you have to have three pieces of student work. Let's say you have no high student, you can get two MET students, kind of a low MET and a high MET. And then you can have the other student also. Um, and that, that will also work. In fact, that was just shared with us a couple weeks ago. Um, so different things can be seen in the video, but you need to see certain things in certain videos. Yes, the thing to make sure exists in your videos is the things you have to annotate for. Now, if you were in one of my classes, I would take a drink of my soda, so you'd write that down. And I'll take a couple, Daryl, and then we can go back and forth. So I saw um, if if only a small group of students did not um, meet the learning goals, can you teach it with just that small group? Yes, that's actually what they're looking for. They're they're looking for that you plan your reteach based on those formal assessment results. So if only five students did not meet the learning goals, they would they're looking for that you do a small group. And I also saw. Like, do I have to create a formal assessment if I teach ed tech? Every single subject area has to do a formal assessment. And then one other question I saw is, if I don't have one-to-one -one devices uh, for the whole class, can I do a small group? Definitely, yes, um, you can have a small group. All right, and so uh, Amanda asked about the, the rubrics. Um, and so her question is, the rubric you created for the students is not the rubric we create for the formal assessment. They can, they can be related, but in the, in the student self-assessment, they're not scoring their formal assessment. They're scoring work that relates to the learning goal, which should relate to the formal assessment, of course, because that's the, the end goal of, of your week, right? Or your, your block of time. Um, uh, and someone else also asked, uh, so, so first of all, the student self-assessment is not them scoring their formal assessment. It's them scoring another, um, uh, another activity, another assessment opportunity where they both check their own work, think about what they need to improve upon to improve their learning, and get some opportunity for feedback from you also. Um, also, uh, um, someone had asked if, if, it, if the, the student self-assessment rubric could be the same rubric as the formal assessment rubric. And the answer to that would be, it depends. It depends on if your students could use both of those rubrics. They could, they could be rubrics on the same content, but the student self-assessment rubric should be accessible by the students. The one that you're using as a formal, as, a, as, a, as the teacher is probably gonna be a little more uh, complex than what you would have the students uh, use. Um, and then, uh, Shauna, would you mind repeating your example about individual whiteboards for the informal assessment? Sure. And I was also going to do, because um, some people wanted to see some more examples of um, self-assessment. So I'm going to do a new share. Okay, great. 
All right. Now, can everyone see it? Yes? Okay, perfect. So here's some examples of some more uh, self-assessment ideas. Um, so the idea is that the content is on the side and then again, it's not happy faces or sad faces or a checklist like Daryl was saying, but then you're having them score. So there's different ways you could do that. Here's an example, um, a few examples of a four point rubric. Uh, and then there's rating themselves on how well they're doing on, on those learning goals. And there's a PE example. And let me see, I think I had, here's another. Um, this is an art example where they're scoring themselves on creativity and art skills. Uh, this one is um, like a, related to a selfie, which like middle schoolers would like, but it's still connected uh, to the learning goals. Okay, so there's just another example for you. And then let one me go the, back. Well, Shauna, one of the other things I've seen for younger children, especially when you're using writing or something like that, is you can have a series of examples that they look at. Mm -hmm. And they check their own writing against those examples. So for younger children where maybe the descriptor is a little difficult to access, matching up against a, an example, a progression of examples. But the big idea is there's a progression and they're kind of able to use that to, to decide, okay, I'm here. I want to make these changes to move over to here. That's, that's the big idea. That's that feedback at 2.7 that they're looking for to give feedback and, and use that actionable feedback to be able to improve them themselves. Uh, um, let me pick a couple others from the, the, the past here. Sure, um, and I know, and I wanna give the, I'll explain that individual whiteboard example. So I was using that as an informal and higher order thinking. Um, so I gave the example of say that you're teaching uh, a lesson on math and that in order to do higher order thinking, the idea is you do an, er an error analysis. So you write a problem on the board that's done incorrectly. And then you have, students discuss in partner groups um, where they see the errors and also how they would fix it. So that's where you're getting in that higher order thinking. And then together they write on an individual whiteboard, first of all, what is the error? And then how would they fix it? And then they hold it up and then you're able to see as the teacher, okay, are they able to recognize the error? And then were they able to write the problem correctly? And then based on that, you go on with your teaching, either with a reteach, you, you provide them feedback based on what you see, and you do some reteaching based on the results. Very good, thank you. Uh, Isenia asks, um, with regards to the student, uh, um, the students using technology, would it just be a clip of up to five minutes long of them working on computers? Remember that when you show them working with the computers and you're going around uh, or just them working, it's important that when you do the annotations that you annotate for what they're doing. That's, that's critical because you can't always see in the video exactly what's happening on the screen. And so you'd annotate what they're, work, what they're working on and how that supports uh, their how it supports their learning. Um, go down to now. We'll drop down to the other set of them below, uh, Erica. Okay. Let me answer this question while you're catching up to where sure. we're down there. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, Caitlin asks about. Uh, on the website, it talks about product, process, and performance. Mm -hmm. um, the reason that they give you these choices is because sometimes people might have a content area and they think, oh, I've got to do a paper and pencil uh, product of some kind. But yet, um, a formal assessment can also be a recording of a performance of some kind. So for example, a music class, you could have a rubric that outlines a certain performance criteria and then you submit a video copy of them doing their performance. Sean, have you seen video submissions yes. for those? Yeah. Yes. Uh, a number of my PE and music teachers, yep. and I've seen it when I'm scoring, but also as I'm coaching students. So right. um, for instance, one of my PE teachers um, did a unit on um, badminton recently. Mm -hmm. And so she had them demonstrate um, serving and the different forms she had taught them and she videotaped them as their assessment. So then she submitted a video for the high, medium, low. And she created a rubric based on the, th I think it was three elements that she had taught them serving and hitting yeah. and volleying uh, that they scored the, that she scored them on for their formal assessment. Yep. And so what you would submit is you'd submit a little video clip plus the scored rubric with feedback. And so that would be, that's a 
That's a great example of, of that. And so that might be an example of, of uh, performance. I don't nece know necessarily if it's important you know whether your specific thing is a product, a process, or a performance, but it, but it does open the gate for you a little bit to think outside the box as far as what your formal assessment is. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a piece of paper that is generated. It can be a video clip. It could be a process they go through. I've seen uh, some students show the culminating work of, pro of a process they engage in. Um, so. And then I see someone's asking what's the order of assessments if people ask that. So there is a typical order, but I'm there, you can switch the order of the self-assessment and the informal, but typically um, people do the informal assessment uh, first uh, and then the self-assessment and then the formal. That's the typical order, but you are allowed to switch the order of the informal and the self-assessment. Yeah, one of the things to kind of think about is once you once you decide what you're going to work on for the week, the, what I would think about doing after that is designing your formal assessment. So that that becomes the culmination of what all the plan, all the all the instruction for the week leads up to them successfully being able to engage in the formal assessment. Then the informal and student self assessment provide feedback to the student and to you to adjust your instruction so that you can make adjustments along the way. Remember at the bottom of each lesson segment, they ask you after you've taught this lesson, what did you, what, what information did you gain from your assessments that might require an adjustment on the next day? And so the big picture for cycle two is the idea that you're actively using assessment as a means to gather information about students to help them get feedback on their own learning and to help you adjust your instruction. Um, and so you, you know, have that. And a final essay can count as a formal assessment if the final essay is what you're working toward throughout the, the week. One of the things they really look for is they look for this progression of instruction throughout the week that culminates in this uh, meeting of the final uh, learning goal for the week that you've identified at the beginning. They really want things to be coherent, to be building up toward that, that piece. And I see a question asking about rubrics. I know it's a common question. So someone asked if they need to create a separate rubric for each learning goal. You do not. Um, you just need a rubric for the self-assessment and for the formal assessment. You see some other ones there that we haven't quite got to yet? I think we've got most of them. And I know um, we. We haven't talked about this yet, Daryl, but the way I normally do this in my uh, TPA classes is I know sometimes people kind of are information overload and they just want to kind of go and like think of, and sign off and say thank you very much. And then others would like to stay and ask questions. So I thought maybe we could do it that way. It's been great seeing all of you. If you uh, feel like you've gotten enough or you have enough information in your brain, uh, feel free to sign off. It was so wonderful to see you. We will be posting this recording on Facebook. So um, it's A-I-C-C-U-E-D. If you search for us, you'll be able to find us and we'll post the recording. Um, those of you that would like to stay on and ask questions, you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask questions. But if you're leaving, it was a pleasure uh, seeing all of you. Maybe we could ask people to use the hand raising. Sure. Mm -hmm. We have 52 people in class and if everyone starts talking. Shutting out, the yes. Them. Yep. Let's grab mm -hmm. a couple of things. So Marisol, you ask if we use the same topic for cycle one and cycle two. That's a depends. If you're a single subject student, a candidate, then you can use, you'll obviously use whatever the area is that you're studying. Like if you're a math teacher, you do math and math. If you're a multiple subject student, on the other hand, one of your cycles has to be math and one has to be literacy. The order doesn't matter, but you have to do one of each. That'll uh, result in a little bit of a problem for you. So you kind of want to avoid that. Eve, I see your hand. Do you want to unmute and put and ask? Hi. Uh, yeah, I I just had a recent meeting with one of the uh, professors from Brandman University, and he said that I like because I just I resubmitted mine and I ended up failing it, hmm. and so he um, he told me that the reason part of the reason why was because I didn't create a rubric for each learning goal. 
So I was confused. I just was confused because you said that we didn't have to, but he told me that that was one of the reasons why. Well, you don't create separate rubrics for each of the learning goals, but on your as on your rubrics, it should address each of the learning goals. Does that okay. make sense? Yes. And so <laughs> just to confirm, the rubrics need to be done for just the self-assessment and the formal assessment. Correct. And for the formal assessment in particular, you do need to go over each of the learning goals and how you're scoring them. Okay, great. And then um, when you give feedback, like on um, like the, the, the three different students, work samples that you provide, mm -hmm. um, th those, the, the types of feedback that you have to give them have to be based on whether or not they met the learning goal. Like, I can't just say like, great sentence writing, and then the sentence, the right. sentence no, it needs to be part of the learning goal, right? Connected to learning goals, right. And then when you're doing that step where you're reflecting, you'll actually right. list each of the learning goals. There's a little graph for you to list them. And then you will reflect on each of those and show how they did on each of those. So everything is connected back to the learning goals. So I think that's what the professor was trying to tell you. Okay. And then those <laughs> learning goals from that graph are the same ones from the learning segment, correct? Correct. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you so okay. much. You're welcome. Hey, Amanda. Yeah, so I just wanted to double check with the self-assessment because I was uh, I was just really confused on the self-assessment. So the self-assessment, so I'm doing ethos, pathos, and logos. So a self-assessment would be like, I can describe ethos, and that's like a one. And then a two would be like, I can describe ethos and identify examples, and that's a two. And then a three would be, I can identify e or uh, describe ethos and come up with my own examples. Is that what it is, right? Am yes. I understanding that correctly? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay, I was totally confused on that. I thought they were, I thought they were using the formal assessment rubric to uh, grade their own formal assessment. So I was very confused. <laughs> Thank you. No, the idea is that this the self assessment is giving you information before they take the formal assessment. Mm -hmm. So um, it's it's so that they know how they're doing and you know how they're doing before they take the formal assessment. Yeah, okay. it, it gives them a chance to get feedback. And to and to to improve their learning before they do that final formal formative assessment. Yeah. Okay. So if I'm doing ethos, pathos, and logos, and I'm trying to get them to understand the concepts to be able to use them in like future papers and stuff, like having them just do ethos, pathos, and logos and rate their understanding on that, is that adequate, or should I have something further in that self assessment? Do you think? You should be having them look at all the learning goals throughout the three to five lessons and rating okay. themselves on that. Okay. Okay. All right. So as long as I have every learning goal, I'm good. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Andrew asked a question, should there be an informal assessment for each day? So it, there doesn't have to be, you're only filming um, one, but would I do it? Yes, I would have a, an informal assessment each day because informal assessments could be a little exit ticket, talk with your partner, use an individual whiteboard, uh, you know, all of those things that we do as teachers, um, we're doing informal assessments, we should be doing them actually multiple times a day. So is it required? No, should you do it? Yes. Yeah. One of the things that each learning segment does ask is what evidence you're going to gather throughout the lesson and no students are meeting the goal. So there should be some kind of measure of that throughout each day. Also, that's the vehicle through which you're going to decide at the end of the day if you needed to make adjustments in the subsequent day. Because you don't make those adjustments just because you went home and came up with a new idea. You use it based upon what you saw as students were learning. And, and that connection then has to be made. So, so yeah, I think Shauna's advice to have some kind of ongoing assessment um, throughout all your lessons is not only good teaching practice, you're always checking for understanding, but it's also going to support what you're asked to do throughout that. Yeah. Suzanne, you want to ask your question? I see your hand. Yeah. Uh, thanks. So I have a couple of questions. One, for the formal assessment, I'm like looking at the camera, it's not even on, sorry. Um, for the formal assessment, the, the product that the students create, does that, is that required to be created in EdTech? You have to 
So everyone, no matter what subject area, has to submit a formal assessment and, and a rubric. So and you have to do three student work samples. No, so what I'm, go ahead. What I'm saying is, do they for their final thing that they do that I'm going to do my form that I'm going to use for my formal assessment? Does the student need to use EdTech to create it, or can EdTech be used elsewhere? Oh, contribute to this Padlet. Okay. Do this Jamboard thing. Do you know what I mean? Right. And so what's your subject area? Is it? ELA. Okay. Yeah. No, you don't have to use uh, technology for the formal assessment. Okay. And then my second <laughs> question is that um, I teach at a high school that we have a traditional six periods a day, every day schedule. However, I'm planning to film this during state testing, which means we're going to be moving to a block schedule. So I'm wondering if two videos, two lessons can be the same day, because if we weren't in block, they would be two different days, but I'm only going to see students three days a week for over a month. And so I can't wait until block schedule is done to do this. I will lose my mind. So yes. how does that work with block? Yes, you're not thinking of it in terms of um, time. You're thinking of it more in terms of lessons. So like if I was doing a block schedule, I'd probably do one lesson, you know, the first part of the, the block and one lesson, the second part. So in okay. that way, fine. So think of it as in terms of lessons, not time in a day. Okay, so you're not gonna look at my outfit and go, oh, that's the same. <laughs> no, people ask me that all the time. No. <laughs> okay, thank you. No, I, I don't have it. It's an assessor, that's the least of my worries, what you're wearing. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. All right. Okay, uh, Bruna. Hi, so I was curious if you guys had any recommendations for um, websites or apps to, for an videos and annotations. Oh, like how to clip your videos? Yes. So I just found them by looking on YouTube. So just look on YouTube, like how to clip your videos. And there's some great ones on there. Annotations you don't need to worry about. Uh, once you upload your clips onto the Pearson website, they will automatically just become a drop down menu for you. There's nothing you have to do technology wise. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah I just go on YouTube and Google how to do video clips, depending on what kind of um, computer you have. And there's some great videos on there. I totally misunderstood. I thought I had to have like writing on the screen explaining mm -hmm. what I was no. doing. You oh. do not want to do that. It, it's a drop down menu for you. I see so Eve said that she used iMovie. Um, yeah, so there's some great resources on it. Oh, awesome. Okay, thank you so much. Great. And I'm probably not going to say your name right. Jer how do you say it? Carolyn, is you can call yes. me Joe. <laughs> okay, Joe, thank you. Yeah, thank I'll you so wrong. much. Mm -hmm. um, and I apologize if I'm repeating the same question. Oh, I'm getting my single. Yeah, ahead. I'm getting my single subject in Spanish, mm -hmm. and so I, um, I pretty much I already recorded my lessons, but um, because I was hearing about the two rubrics, so I know I did one for the formal assessment, and I did have my students complete a self assessment, um, which was through a. Um, I'm trying to think, sorry, a, a Google um, form, like those kind of quiz that they can answer. And I went, you know, I talked to them in, in class and explained, okay, this is, you know, we're going to go over what we've practiced and all that. Um, do I need, when I submit it, do I need a rubric for that? Or can it be the actual test or not test, the actual um um google form, form that they submitted uh-huh the only way it could be a google form is if you the google form was created as a rubric it has to be a rubric and that's your top score for that segment and you going over the rubric is your top score so if you didn't use a rubric you'll want to refilm that one okay oh you mean using a rubric as i was talking to them the, the actual self-assessment has to be a rubric. So when you were describing Google Forms, it sounded like they were just like writing about how they did. Oh, I see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it has to be an actual rubric. Right. Like the examples I showed you where they, you know, like a one, two, three or a four. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, Erica. Okay. So, um, 
I definitely know now that I'm gonna have to refilm some of this, but um, I liked your idea with the, what did you call it? An air board or air? It, I called it an air analysis. Yeah. An air analysis. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thinking of something like that, cause I'm doing math, I put it up on the board and I can have the kids tell me whether it's done correctly or not. And then you mentioned the technology. Can I have them do a Padlet about how to fix it? Would that count as two of the videos or no? So you can't double dip your videos. Does that make sense? So you have to do um, a, a separate one on technology and a separate one on informal assessment using higher order thinking. Uh, if you use higher order thinking and you use technology, that's fine for your informal assessment, but then you need to do a separate different thing using technology. You can't use the same activity slash clip for two videos. Okay, so can I, um, sh like when I uh, notate it, annotate it, sorry, um, mm -hmm. do I annotate, annotate it um, using just uh, with technology and then higher order of thinking, or do I have to drop one of them? So there's, and I'm gonna go back to, let me share the screen and go back to that one screen. It's two separate things, the titles and the, the annotations. So can you see it? Okay, so going back to here. Okay. So okay. you wanna separate these two things in your mind. So when you're talking about, so don't worry about annotations yet. You're going to do one video of students using educational technology and it's a separate activity than the one that you have them do higher order thinking and an informal assessment. So you now you upload both of these video clips uh, into Pearson and then all of these annotation titles will automatically appear and you'll be able to select them and you can use these annotation titles across all four video clips. So you may be using higher order thinking in all four video clips. You may be using technology in all four video clips. Oh, I don't know. Okay. Does that okay. make sense? Or maybe Daryl can explain it better. <laughs> so like your activity where you have the students um, do the error analysis, and then they talk about how to fix it on a Padlet. If you wanted to, that, that could be clip number three with higher order thinking in it. And, and but in clip number three, you could identify um, uh, students using educational technology, and you could identify uh, if you give students feedback, you give them feedback, and you might even be able to uh, talk about how you're assessing their higher order thinking. And all three of those annotations could be in clip number three. Okay, so would I, so I would go ahead and comment on those, on those parts, correct? Yes, yeah. yes. The annotation then, titles um, you want to use across the board. What I was saying you couldn't double dip on are the video clips, the one, two, three, and four that I'm showing on the screen. Those are the things where you have to have three, four separate clips that are different activities. Okay, so I'm just strengthening. Um, I'm just strengthening the the uh, support of whatever I'm doing by doing another one. So there would technically be for me uh, two technology that I would be demonstrating. So basically in your instructional uh, informal assessment and higher order thinking, you're using technology, um, but it's not your technology video. Yes, but you would still talk about it in your annotation title. Awesome, I got it, thank you. Good. Yeah, no, I'm glad you asked for clarification. And it's nice when there's two of us, we can both explain. Hey, okay, Ashley. Oops, Ashley, we're not hearing you. Okay, uh, Kimberly. Hi, yes, I just have a question because the informal assessment, mm -hmm. I thought it was, it met the exception, I guess you could say, but now I'm kind of worried. Um, basically what I did was um, I'm doing a writing on Earth Day. And so I had like a mini quiz just to see how much the students learned from like videos and articles that we read about Earth Day. 
And I just had like a three question quiz. And basically I did a whole group just because it's third grade and they're still having trouble reading. So I did a whole group um, quiz where they would answer, like I would read the answers like A, B, C, D. They would select their answers. I would walk around and see how they did. And at the end of that, we, um, we reviewed the whole quiz as a whole. To, so that way they can reflect on their learning. I don't know if that meets the whole informal assessment. Um, the part I'm not hearing is uh, the higher order thinking um, and that you're then kind of changing how you're teaching based on um, what you're seeing in that in the moment informal assessment. So those, those, that's what you're scored on. One, that you're doing an informal assessment, higher order thinking. Um, and the last thing is that uh, you're changing in the moment based on what you're seeing. Okay, because I know, meant, uh, uh, excuse me, you mentioned something about thumbs up, thumbs down for something along the lines of the informal assessment? So a thumbs up, thumbs down would be a, a not a good way to do it. Okay. So we might've said it as like a non-example. Okay, perfect. Okay, Lindsay. Um, so I just had a question about um, the formal assessment. Um, this is going to be my third time submitting my portfolio because the first two times they were thrown out on a technical error. Um, so my lesson was um, first grade math with um, place value. And I had them do a performance assessment where they use um, place value blocks to show how to create a three digit number and then explain why they chose the blocks they did. And looking back at my old scores and what got thrown out is that they said that I didn't include the formal assessment, the product, what the students did. And I videotaped the three students um, like doing the whole performance thing and I couldn't figure out where to put it. So I put the rubrics in, I don't know what part I did wrong and why it got thrown out twice. So I was hoping to get some clarification on that. Yeah, so, so, what was, what, so what did they, um, so your whole class did the formal assessment, right? Mm -hmm. What did they do for the assessment? Describe to me what they did. It was a, it was first grade um, math, three digit place value, like hundreds, tens, ones. And I had them do a performance where they would, I would just call them one by one and they would draw a three digit number like from a stack of cards that would have like a three digit number on it. And they had to use the place value blocks to create the number and then explain why they chose the blocks that they did. Okay, and you made individual recordings of each student doing this. I had my three target students. I all the students did it, and I recorded the three target students. Did you throw show them all in one clip? No, it was three individual clips for the three students. Okay. Did you have a rubric with each of those? Yes. Okay. Did you um, describe in part C when you're talking about the formal assessment that you were going to do a performance of them orally describing that? Yes. Okay. So I had this issue actually, Daryl, with one of my PE teachers. Okay. Um, because I, I was hoping they would have this fixed by now, but I think there's only one spot to actually upload both the um, formal assessment and the rubric as one document, correct? Mm -hmm. And that's the issue. Is that what you ran into? I think that's what happened because I couldn't figure out how to get the clips in and like the rubrics. So like the first time I tried to put the clips in, but I couldn't figure out how. And I forget exactly what I did to try to get it in there, but they threw it out. So the second time I just put the rubrics and it got thrown out because I didn't have the performance piece. I didn't have the clips of them describing their work. So what, what my student ended up doing is actually um, videotaping um, the performance. And then she actually included in the video a screenshot of the rubric at the end. I'm um, allowed to do that? 
Yeah, so I asked, um, there actually should be two spots. So I have asked about that. I think they're working on fixing it, but that's how we got around what, what she had to do because they don't provide two separate um, turn-in spots, unfortunately. Okay, because um, I did this all a year ago. Yeah. So like I'm out of student teaching, I'm a full-time teacher now, but I need to get this done. Um, so. Yes. I mean, and if you want a surefire, you might want to switch from a performance assessment and just do a paper assessment um, at this point if you're a full-time teacher. So I'd have to redo my entire TPA? No, just the formal assessment. Okay, because I'm not with this class anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. I see what you're saying. Um, so then you might want to go with my first thing is where you provide at the end of the video a screenshot of your rubric. Okay. Because mm -hmm. um, I talked with a teacher at my school who's a PhD student and is working with students on their TPA, like actual student teachers, and he mentioned part I, where I could include that in. So I do have to have the clips and the rubrics yes. for it to pass. Okay. All right. So I'll try that then. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Ashley. Hey, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, sorry, my mic was connected to my headphones. I didn't realize I was trying to talk over here. Um, so I just had a question on video clip three, which is the instruction and informal assessment of content. Um, what I did is I, I recorded a, a, um, a part of my lesson was me explaining to students the higher order thinking skills verbs. I kind of had a verb chart and I had definitions of those verbs. And I asked them to give me some examples of questions they could use with those verbs um, as we were about to read our story and talking about film. So um, it, and, I, and then I gave them feedback based on the questions they gave me using those higher order thinking verbs. Um, I, I'm wondering if that can be, is that an acceptable clip? Because it wasn't necessarily part of my informal ass assessment, which was an exit ticket, but it was using those higher thinking skills and giving them feedback. Um, so, and the exit ticket did include those particular vocabulary words. So I'm just wondering if I could have some feedback on that idea. Shauna, can you help? I have yeah. a hard time. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's multiple types of informal assessments. And um, instead of students just like sitting and working on an exit ticket, you do wanna have it more interactive. So the what you describe sounds like it's on the right track. What I would recommend is um, like Daryl was saying, really look at the rubric um, for video clip three. There's one specifically for it and have the rubric in front of you, watch your video and make sure like as you're watching the video, check off all the things in levels three, four or five that you see or don't see in your video to make sure that it's a good fit. Can we add in a question? Elizabeth asked a question about not editing the videos and you talked about adding a screenshot at the end. The videos that can't be edited are clip one, two, three, and four, mm -hmm. and the fifth video clip that's for the reteach. The video clip though for the performance could have that added on to the end and that wouldn't count as an error code, correct? Correct. Yeah, yeah, the other ones cannot be edited. And edited, we mean stop and start. You can't put any um, written things in there or effects. Yeah, so you just have to play it straight through. So sometimes I'll have students say, well, I wanted to cut out the middle because they were just like cleaning up and, and that wasted time. So you will get an error code and automatically it won't be scored if you stop and start your video. Yeah. All right, Patricia. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, hi. Um, I had a question about um, just kind of clarifying the 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 double dipping in in terms of I don't know if like I'm I don't think that I am because I use Nearpod a lot, um, but it it focuses on two different aspects of one I'm using Nearpod for academic language, so we're kind of watching uh, an informational video. So kind of the like an ed puzzle where you include questions and they're answering, but I'm not using that as my technology. Um, my technology is still using a Nearpod, but it's a different, completely different activity. Yeah, that's completely fine. It just can't be the same lesson, same clip, you know. So it's a bit different activity, but still the same technology. That's fine. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and then uh, in terms of like watching a video like a like kind of like 
a, an informational video that talks that relates on the topic that we're talking about um, and then reflecting in the moment, would that be considered academic language as long as we're having a in-class conversation as well? Um, so I wouldn't say like using like having like using your video for students to watch a video would be the best use of your five minutes. Uh, you would want to maybe start your video after the the students watching the video has ended and it would be you filming the discussion piece and maybe having them do some pair share and then after the pair share calling on students, but you want want to like use up your five minutes of them of showing a video. I don't know, Daryl, if you want to add to that. No, I think that's a good that that's a good thing to think about if you want to connect the instruction to the video. Remember that and this goes this this goes also well for the student self assessment. Let's say that this this little my finger is one is you showing the student self assessment how to use it, and then right mm -hmm. after that is them using it. Mm -hmm. I I would have my little video traverse those two activities, so you're showing the end of you showing them how to use it and the beginning of them using it and you walking around. So the same is true with this. Here's your video of them watching it. Maybe show the last thirty seconds of that and then get into the discussion and the interaction with students. You right. Can still, then you can annotate if, if the video clip is something you want to annotate for them watching the video, you can annotate for that little 30 seconds and say, this is the end of us watching the video. We're doing blah, blah, blah. Then you can annotate the rest. But yeah, a five minute clip of them sitting there watching the video is um, not going to meet the requirement for that language. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's kind of what I meant. Like, like not the whole five minutes, mm -hmm. but in terms of like including like like you said, 30 seconds of it. Um, because it's like a, a, a near uh, ed puzzle style. It's like watching a video of uh, academic, of the language that we're learning, them, and then the question pops up, they're answering, but we're also talking for the remainder of those five minutes okay. as a class, not, not of them watching a five minute video. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. But a good mix okay. of activity of them learning and you checking on how they've learned the academic language is right. what you're looking for in that in that first uh, clip, and that's uh -huh. what you're annotating for in the assessing student learning and development of academic language. Okay. Active, active engagement about that. Okay, perfect. All Thank right. you. Hey, Jen. Hi. So I'm a PE. I'm PE, um, and so my perform. I'm doing performance assessment. We're doing a weight training unit, and so my students are obviously in the weight room lifting weights. Um, and so my question, I asked my professor last night and she wasn't sure, um, was about the time limit for the performance assessment part. I know everything else has to be under five minutes, but is there a certain time limit then that for my three students, because I'm assessing them actually lifting weights in stations and that takes more than five minutes um, in regards to that. So, so I guess my question is, can, can I only show part of that? Do I need to show the whole thing? Does that make sense? Well, when, I mean, and, uh, and Shauna can confirm this, um, as a resident expert, but what you could do is if you showed them throughout all the stations, you could then clip that piece to show right. each station that's relevant to the rubric. So the okay. information that's on the video should yep. be relevant to the rubric. So wiping off the machine, that's not relevant to the rubric, unless Correct. of course your learning goal is to be sanitary. But <laughs> I'm guessing it's not, right? Correct, and, it is not. It's just them so performing the, the exercise. Yeah, yeah. So, so that video clip could be, you could, you could clip out, you could show them on a machine, cut, stop, show them on a machine, stop, and then use your rubric to check those pieces you've shown. And okay. that, would, that would match very nicely. Then you're not submitting, you know, 10 minutes, and seven minutes is uh, unrelated to the rubric. That would probably uh, help your score a little bit because it focuses the connection between the formal assessment and the rubric. And that's the big kind of connection you want to make there is how that formal assessment checks those learning, uh, learning goals for the week and how you've used that rubric as a tool to give actionable feedback and to plan your lessons. So yeah, that'd work very nicely. Okay, so just to clarify, so even so, it wouldn't get thrown out. Say if it was just over five minutes, or if it didn't include no, yeah, all like fine. sixteen stations or whatever. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, right. perfect. Thank you. And just to clarify, the rest of you that are listening, just to, I always like to emphasize when Daryl and I are talking about 
um, editing, it's only for if you're using it as your actual formal assessments, you're not allowed to edit any of the other videos. So I just like to keep reemphasizing yes. because I don't want your TPA to get thrown out um, for editing. Yeah, never want a condition code because it doesn't get scored. And then you right. get kind of the double zap, you don't know if you passed, and then you got to repay. All right, Julie, what's your question? Hi, um, I actually have a few questions. So I am, I am, I'm, I'm a question asker, so this is all right. Um, okay, so one is, but I kind of come kind of with more questions as other people ask questions. <laughs> so the learning goals, um, you know, I, I have my uh, standard broken down into, you know, various learning goals. Um, and then, but informal assessments, a lot of times we'll just focus on like one of those learning goals, right? So um, is it okay, like, do you have to show each of those students like working toward each of those learning goals in your videos or does can it like should is it just like a sample like here's a video of them working on this particular learning goal so let me go back do you know what i'm saying like um so so the example with the self-assessment can they just be assessing themselves on that day's learning goal like uh you know we're just finishing um hey julie you're breaking up a little bit let Deshauna answer your first question yes, I uh, okay, good. She's gonna sorry, answer. Julie. I, did, I only muted you just because you were breaking up and we couldn't hear you, but don't worry, I'll unmute you in just a second. So, um, you were it was getting distorted and we couldn't hear you. Um, but I did hear your first question. So, I think my internet is uh, a little touchy, so it might be there might be a delay. Okay. Yes, it was um, spreading out. <laughs> um, but I heard your first question. So when you're thinking about your video clips, um, they're not, don't think of it so much about learning goals. You're thinking about showcasing particular uh, strategies. So, and I'm going to meet you just because you were getting feedback. Um, there we go. Uh, so video clip one is that instruction in academic language. Uh, video clip two is technology. Video clip three is that informal uh, assessment and four is the self-assessment. So throughout all of these, you're touching on different learning goals, but you're highlighting these different things. So video clip one might just be related to one learning goal related to academic language. Video clip two might be one learning goal. Video clip three might be one and video clip four might be a number of learning goals. But so think of it more as you're showing these different strategies in these video clips not that you're showing a video for each learning goal. Hopefully I answered your question. Okay, let's have uh, Marisol, let's hear your uh, question. Hello, so I think I asked my question wrong the first time. Um, what I wanted to know was for cycle one, I focused on teaching the verbo tener in Spanish. Mm -hmm. So um, I recorded like a whole week um, for, <laughs> I recorded the whole week. So I'm not sure if um, I'm able to use the same topic as like the same, uh, um, not lesson, but um, I did several lessons, um, just like do cycle two on the verbo tener as well, or should I pick something completely different? So let me ask you this. So did you, for cycle one, did you work on the verbo tener? For cycle one, yes, that's what okay. they worked on. And so you're asking if then cycle two can be uh, a new set of lessons that go with the verbo tener? Is that what you're asking? Correct. Okay. 
So I don't know that there's any restriction on the content for cycle one and cycle two, other than if you teach Spanish, they should both be Spanish. Yes. So if you do, if you tener for one, and then you do, you know, tener for the other one, that would, uh, that, that there's not a problem with that. Oh, okay. Just wanted to make sure. So it doesn't look like I'm using the same video, but no, I would use, um, it's not the same lesson or anything. Right, right. Maybe you're going to go work with, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, yo, tu, and usted for the first part. And the second is going to be all the core versions of that. Exactly. Right? Then you're going to throw in some voceo and say, you know, help them understand. Ah, mirad, che. And then they can kind of, you know, do some of that too, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> I love your accent, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> no, and that's exact, exactly right. I tell my history teachers the same thing because, like, sometimes they're on World War II for like two months, you know. Right. So the, both cycles are going to be on World War II. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so it is fine. Okay, yeah. wanted to make sure so it wasn't like that it wasn't like plagiarizing or I don't know, oh. it would get me in trouble. And then um, really quick also, um, you did say we can, so if we're using the same group of students, we can copy and paste from cycle one. For um, the, yes, for the learning about students, the contextual information. Mm -hmm. Okay. Template A on both ones. Um, just make sure that when you when you drop those in, that you read the questions and make sure that the information you've copied and pasted in matches the question. Okay, perfect. Thank that's, you. So that's much. the one thing to be a little careful of. That's all. Yeah, not not that I'm just copying everything. Yeah, just watching. The, not even checking. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank all right, you Kitty. so much. You're welcome. Thank all right, Kitty. Hi, thank you. I, I too have a few questions. I heard you speaking with Julie and you said, uh, for clips one through four, the lesson goal does not need to be the same, but they need to, do they need to be related? Yes. Okay. They should progress. Now here's a big piece cycle. Okay. The second rubric checks to see that your lessons progress toward a common set of learning goals. Okay. So if you're working on, if at the end of the week, let's say the end of the week, your goal is to write a paragraph. Okay. And so Let's say that on day one, you're working with, um, you know, academic language related to that. You're building some background knowledge for what they're going to do. Then day two, you work on topic sentences. Then you work on details. Then you work on closure. Maybe for your self-assessment, they do a little practice paragraph and check themselves with their student self-assessment. Then for the formal assessment, they do a, a, a paragraph on whatever the prompt is. See how that all goes toward flow. that end at the end? Right. It's all got to flow. So okay. you can't all of a sudden throw in something about, um, you know, what it's, you know, my favorite restaurant, an opinion piece. It's all got to go the same direction. And the evaluators watch for that. That's actually cycle. The, the second rubric focuses on a progression toward that learning goal. Yeah. Toward that and, assessment. and I'm hearing now the, the understanding of the lesson goal where you said it might be you're teaching an introduction or a closing statement versus, um, uh, well, not verses, but that you're teaching those two things, but it's all about a narrative, let's say, personal narrative. It's all about personal narrative. They're just different pieces of that puzzle. Right, um, right. Th think about building up toward that. Okay. I mean, over the course of three to five lessons, you wouldn't start, hey, today we're going to do an opinion piece. Let me tell you the 15 pieces I want you to learn, and you're all going to do them today. No, good instruction would build up toward that so the culminating experience would be they're able to write that or okay. write that piece. Yes. My next question is with regard to the, well, progression. So the formal assessment, would that take place and then the reflection and then the reteach? Yes. Right. Okay. That's the order. Yeah. The reteach. Yeah. Because the reteach is based upon the evidence you've gathered in your assessments. Okay. So when you look at, when you look at your, when you look at your analysis of your formal assessment and your reflection on each of your student self-assessment and your informal assessment, you take all that assessment data and you ask yourself, how did my students do? Wow, they did great on, on details. They have a great closing sentence, but it was a total bomb job on the introduction. I'm gonna reteach the introduction. Okay. Or, or I had five students that couldn't do details. I'm gonna pull a small group and focus on five students. 
And that reteach section is what you were talking about that can be pieced together, unlike the other four that have to be. No, the, oh. the, the, the video of the fifth, the fifth video clip that is the you doing the reteach cannot be edited. It has to be continuous. Okay. Which part, which of the videos, then there's five videos, which of the videos is the one that is allowed to be? So none of, none of the video clips of you teaching can be, can be edited. edited. Okay. Okay. You, thank you. Yes. So for you, if, yeah, for, if you're, turning, it, if you're turning in a video of someone doing a test or the formal assessment, then that can be edited. But all the five videos of you teaching have to be continuous, unedited, un anything. Okay. And it can't be longer than five minutes. Okay. And finally, I, I teach virtually. And so I'm a little bit anxious about the educational technology piece. And I'm doing mine on, I did my first on math. So I'm doing literacy right now. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about doing some sort of opinion narrative or uh, so they're going to write just you, your example is perfect because that's what I'm thinking about doing. Um, and for my technology piece, I was thinking maybe what they could do is um, do present in a PowerPoint, but I'm nervous that if it's only five minutes, I mean, I don't know how many students they're not, they're fourth and fifth graders. They're not going to be quick. So I don't know how I could really make that look. I mean, I'm, they may only see one student, which I don't think is going to be a good reflection. Do you have any other thoughts on that or suggestions, recommendations? Well, what, what the standard says for four is that the technology enhances collaborative work. So is there a way for them in the process of learning to do that writing that they could use technology to do some kind of collaborative writing? Um, I, I'm so good at doing it with the math, but the language arts is, is difficult. Um, so you can I, even do like, cause remember the technology doesn't have to be at the end. It could be when you're just teaching them in the beginning about yeah. opinion writing. So maybe they could collaboratively work on a jam board or a padlet yeah. where they're just writing a short little example of opinions. Oh, mm -hmm. I see. Yes, and brainstorm, that would count as a three, not a two. Right, because they're working um, together in a group. Collaboratively, okay. And if, I, you, and if you gave them choice, you could get a four. So if you said right. you could use Jamboard or Padlet or Flipgrid, you know, that way they have people, the Flipgrid is for people that like to video themselves. So you gave them choice, you could, could even get a four or a five. But how can I show that when I'm online with them? Like, how can I record us all online together? Right. So the, I would suggest using um, like Flipgrid um, or Jamboard and Padlet, and then you could actually share your screen as they're working on it and have like them on the side. So if I was sharing my screen right now and it's live, like I do this all the time in class where everyone's working on Padlet and I share my screen, everyone's face is on the side. And it also shows them um, what's ever happening on Padlet is appearing. Okay. Let, mm -hmm. let me research that. Thank you so much for that mm -hmm. idea. Thank you. I appreciate it. And thank you to, for tonight, too. This was great. Oh, yeah. You're welcome. All right. Uh, Ev, uh, Eve, sorry. Hi. Yes. Uh, just one, actually, a couple more quick questions for you. Um, I So where did you say we could find this recording again on Facebook? You said it was A-I-C-C-U. E-D. ED. So all one word or? Yeah, if you look for that group on Facebook. Donna, I can try to get it up for you. Thank okay. You. I need to Perfect. help that. Help I'll, I'll get that. Perfect. Okay, thank you so much. And then um, is it possible? It's totally fine if, if you'd rather not, but is it possible for any of us to like contact one of you in case we have another question or like through email or if not, no worries. I just wanted to ask. We're, we're offering this as a service. I know it's no problem to ask, um, but because there's so many of you and we also have our own students, we're not giving out our emails, but. Um, no yeah. problem. I just mm -hmm. wanted to throw that out there. And then one last question. Um, so in the contextual information for this, um, I got this portion wrong a couple of times um, in my submission. And um, it, it asks, there's a part where it asks for stand, the number of standard 
uh, English speakers redesignated and English only. For some reason, like I, the, when I was student teaching, I never asked these specific numbers to my master teacher. Um, and I just kind of estimated based on my experience with the kids. So obviously I got that first one wrong, but then I went back and I tried to do some re more research on it and see if I could get the actual numbers. And it ended up being wrong again due to what the professor had told me when we went over my TPA after it was submitted. And he said that the numbers just didn't make sense and that I had to get the exact information. How do I, I'm, I'm full-time teaching right now, a second grade class. And I, I don't know any of these exact numbers still. I mean, I, how do I get that information? Um, so a couple of things, They you, you're not gonna get a score, um, like you wouldn't fail that section just based on the numbers that you put for the ELs. It was probably what you wrote, the details that you wrote about um, the whole class uh, in that section. So remember you wanna use, I, I would just read through and make sure that you're providing detailed information from a variety of sources and that you're not using deficit thinking, you're using asset thinking. Um, but you should have just, it's fine if you have a ballpark at this point of the number of ELs. And I, I wanna make sure, do you understand what a standard English learner is? Um, yeah, it did say in the TPA, but um, I think it said like uh, a child whose native language is not spoken at home, but or is spoken at home, but there's slang or something that's been that's being used, and it's not. It's, it's a, yeah, it's it's a version of English <clears throat> that is that is varied enough from the language that's used in school. Okay. To create a situation where that student needs some support to work in school. So my family's from North Carolina, despite the fact they have a nice Argentine accent. Um, and uh, but in out in outside in, in North Carolina, there's an island just off the Outer Bank, and in that island, they speak probably the the English that is most close to the original people who came here from England. It's very difficult to understand them. Their okay. dialect is English, but they're very difficult to understand <laughs> because the dialect is so varied from what you'd hear like in the school setting. So if those students came in, they moved over to to Raleigh Durham. And they came into Raleigh Durham, and we had them in a public school. We might need to assist them with some supports, like the supports that we would use with English learners, because the difference in their home language, their home version of English, is is, is inhibits their access to the school uh, English. And that's, I hope that's a really, uh, I hope that clears that up for you. Yeah. So, so I mean. What if I'm not entirely sure about the type of language they speak at home due to my time spent with that student? It's, you know, I'm not noticing anything different. I mean, is it just what I've what I notice in class or do I have to ask someone or yeah, and at this point, now that you're done, just do I would do your best. Um yeah. well, I'm actually redoing my TPA, my okay. entire TPA with this new class. Yeah. So you should look in their QM files. You should talk with other teachers, gather as much information as you can, talk with guardians, parents, mm -hmm. uh, get as much actual information. If they, obviously, if they are EL, you would have that information. If they're standard English learners, you might learn that more through talking with parents or guardians. Um, but the reason I was thinking maybe your numbers were off is some of my students think standard English learners are anyone that speak English. So they'll put like 25 uh, standard right. English learners, which is usually not the case. Right. Yeah. I have 25 students, seven uh, speak our ELs, and everybody else is a standard English learner. In that case, that's that's not accurate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. it's not so just it, everyone else. Right, yeah. so where it says just English, that would be English language learners then, like EL students? Because there's standard, there's English, and then it says redesignated and English only. So English only is just like, that's their first language, they've never spoken another language. Mm -hmm. And then redesignated is where, they um, they spent a couple years being EL or something, and now they're finally, you know, able to um, speak English fluently with the you know proper English language development, and then they're so they're redesignated yeah. English. So so typically in schools, the redesignation label and the EL label are identified as a legal requirement. 
What makes the e, what makes the, the 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 standard English learner a little more tricky is not every district identifies that group, and so you have to do what Shana said, which is if you have students who's who's uh, who speak English as their first language, as their their primary language at, at home is a form of English, and that English um, uh, uh, in talking to parents or in working with a student appears to create uh, some kind of barrier for accessing the content in school, then that might be someone you'd identify. I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't do that very liberally. Right. There's not a lot of students that are in our, there's in our school <clears throat> that aren't identified. Yeah. But then to summarize Eve, I've never, as an assessor, I've never not passed someone on that rubric, rubric because of the numbers they put in for ELs. Yeah. I have not passed someone because they've used deficit language or they haven't written enough about the whole class. Or the right. Mm -hmm. okay. So when you describe the ELs, you really, like Shana said, you want to describe all the aspects of them. Don't just list their CELT scores. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's let's get a uh, question from uh, Shea Shri. Jay Shri. Did I say that correct? Um, Jay is fine too. Jay. Okay. We'll go by Jay. Thanks. Okay. Um, so I actually submitted my Cal TPA, my second one, second cycle, and I got an E7 code. Um, so with my students, I didn't have any students that exceeded expectations. And so um, what I was told is that I would just submit something that says no student who exceeded. But from what Shauna said, that's not correct. I should have done something else. So obviously I got no um, scores on anything. I just got the condition code. And so I don't know if um, what to do at this point? Do I just resubmit it with one of the other students that I had or um, do I need, I mean, I did this last year, I submitted it back in July and then I got a full-time job. And so now I'm teaching first grade full-time. And so I really don't wanna have to re-record it, but I do have all the samples that I you know, did with that class and it was all virtual. So just wondering what I should do. So you just need a range of scores. So the a good way to think about it instead of exceeded is just a range. So even if they all, all students got C's or D's, you would do your um, lowest D, a middle C and a high mm -hmm. C. Same thing if they all get A's, you would do your highest A, the most exemplary middle and uh, low A. So it's a range of scores is not necessarily um, exceeded middle and low. Okay, okay. That was my only question, thank mm -hmm. you. Sorry, I should ask you that faster. That's okay. <laughs> All right, Julie. All right. Can this should be better? Does this? Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> okay. Um, sorry, ter terrible connection here. Okay. So, um, what did I ask already? Okay. So you answered my question before. So it's not really like they can just be tackling one, like working on one learning goal in one video, one in another. Right. That's what you're saying. Okay. Um, let's see, can, uh, for the formal assessments, can a formal assessment be something like, I'm a science teacher in middle school science, like developing a model of a phenomenon they've been learning about. And then a lot of times, like I have them, um, draw, you know, we have like a model rubric, the title, draw, label, and then, uh, explain like there's a section at the bottom where they um explain their like the phenomenon that's happening uh is that something that could be used or like a cer or something like that or is it better to just go with a more traditional like here's some multiple choice and some multiple answer questions and like fill in the you know and then like a short answer question kind of more traditional assessment. so so what shauna said when she was going over the particular parts which i think is really important to realize is when you plan that formal assessment you want to plan something that creates a lot of good evidence to analyze yeah if you if you do something like multiple choice it's very limited in how you can analyze that Right. A performance, a performance assessment, like say a demonstration of an experiment, uh, that could work very well. Just okay. make sure that just make sure that when you develop your rubric, that your rubric lines assess the learning goals. Mm -hmm. So what you, what you don't want is let's say that let's say you're going to do um, a science fair project and you're going to have a poster board, right? One of your rubric lines probably shouldn't be the the writing is neat. Okay. I'm going to guess that that's not one of your learning goals for the week. Right. So the learning goal, the rubric 
the learning goals and what you assess all have to match. Mm -hmm. Really okay. stay tight on that. And then yeah. have something, have something that provides lots of perspectives of their learning. You know, you can look at this aspect of it, how good is their hypothesis, how good mm -hmm. is their evidence, how well do they interpret the results. Boy, there's a lot of stuff that could be analyzed. The more there is to analyze, the better okay. the analysis will be. The killer analysis is when you can't, there's nothing to say. Right. Then you're dead yeah. in the water. You, you're just okay. stuck. I mean, can't analyze what there's nothing to analyze. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, perfect. Because I like to have assessments where they're showing me a lot of different concepts and skills, you know, all at once. But I wasn't sure if that's, you know, like, yeah. should I have it more focused? But that's, be right, it's better to have them kind of showing me a lot of like concepts and skills that are all related to the specific yes all related yeah. to what you're learning right. for that yeah. block of time exactly. yeah okay um and then can this start like in the middle of a unit or do you really want to see kind of like a self-contained uh unit for this do they want to see like a, a small it's three to five lessons that are in a yeah. seat um, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So building up just three to five lessons building up to mm -hmm. an assessment. Okay. Mm -hmm. Perfect. It, it could be um, a sub part of a big study on ecosystems. Mm -hmm. And you have some sub part where you're looking at biodiversity and you okay. look at that, for example. Sure. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. And then I think I wrote down something else. I'm sorry. Um Oh, for the self-assessment, um, someone had mentioned Google Forms. And actually, usually when I do self-assessments, I do this, like I'll have an image of their rubric. Like if I have a, if they have an image of their self-assessment rubric and then they get to pick, you know, multiple choice style, the one, you know, why they got, they, I think I got the three, I was able to blah, 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 blah. And then having a short answer afterwards, why did you select, um, like explain why you got that score or, or is it, is, should it be something like on paper where they circle? I don't know. Cause I know you said something like maybe the Google form wasn't the best way. No, a Google form could work as long as yeah. it's designed as a rubric. The example that I was saying it wouldn't work is it wasn't designed as a rubric. Okay. Mm -hmm. So as long as the rubric's clearly a part of that Google form and they are like, they're self-assessing based on that rubric. And then um, a lot of- Julie, time, can I add yeah. one little piece to that? Yes, yes. One please. thing you briefly mentioned, that's a good idea, mm -hmm. which is after they've kind of checked their work against the rubric, you're asking them, you know, what did I do well on? What do I want to continue to improve upon? That was my next question. Okay, because a lot of, of I that, do like that to, kind I of like to... that, that kind of reflection yes. with actionable steps to move forward is is the whole idea behind the rubric. That's the whole idea of them checking their work. Awesome. That was my next question because I like to tie in reflect. I I usually phrase it as a I tell them we're doing a reflection now of our work. I don't usually say self assessment. And then, but uh, I'll have like one short answer question. That's like, what did you, what were your strengths? What did you do well? And then a question that's like, what, um, based on this, like what do you need to improve on? Or do, what are your goals? Um, for, like, is that, would that be okay to have it like a uh, question and two, like two separate questions, one for their strengths and one for their areas of growth? Yes. Yeah, any, any yeah. kind of opportunity to reflect upon okay. how the rubric went mm -hmm. and work. We can't tell you that exact thing and tell you exactly what to put. That's mm -hmm. way too much help. Mm -hmm. Right. No, no, no. I, I'm just saying yeah. like, any, is any that... kind of reflection <laughs> okay. where, they, where they identify and think what they're going to do moving perfect. forward, however you phrase that or however you engage it. And for little kids, it can be very simple. You know, they yeah. well, I have middle schoolers, but they, well, you know, I'm trying to get them to step up their reflection so um i'm sorry i have one last question let me let me let me have you wait a oh, second and let's sure. have kitty ask a question okay we'll come yeah. right back to you. okay kitty what's your question yes i just wanted to ask about a rubric for the narrative if i were to use like spelling or grammar as a part of that would that align with being appropriate for the the learning goals or it needs to be 
strictly if we were talking about conclusion it's just about conclusion the rubric is just about con a conclusion what are your learning goals for the week uh well it would be like an opening and transition words and, and a conclusion so but grammar and spelling couldn't be wouldn't it fit as a part of that writing that an ongoing part of your instruction during the week um I think it fits with writing as a part of, you know, having Don't a good- Why don't you add on to that since you score those directly? Yeah, so you really wanna, you have to start with your standards and then you create your learning goals and then you create your lessons based on there. So the only reason you would include spelling and grammar in this particular uh, unit, like three to five lessons, is if it was like one of your lessons for a day um, on grammar and spelling, and it was a part one of your standards, and it was one of your learning goals. Otherwise, you know, I know uh, spelling and grammar are important, but for this purpose of this, you're really focused in on those standards and learning goals. Yeah. Okay. Th thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. Well, you do that. The diagram that you just did again. You started with uh, the standards. Standards, and then you make your learning goals specifically based off those standards. You, pay, you plan your lessons um, based on the, your learning goals, and then your formal assessment covers every one of those learning goals. So if if you didn't talk about it in one of your lessons, if it wasn't one of your learning goals, it can't be included on your formal assessment. Perfect. Thank you so much. And thank you again. Yep. Okay, Julie. Uh, thank you. Sorry. So the last thing was to that first video um, where you're working on academic language. Um, are they looking for like tier two or tier three language or anything, any language that just kind of is most best suited for what you're working on at the time? Academic language related to whatever your set of content is. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I've had people that are working on reading comprehension standards mm -hmm. and they build academic language relevant to the reading they're going to do during the week. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's it's the academic language you need to access the content throughout the uh, through through that context. That's it. Okay. Great. Uh, thank you.